Welcome everyone. We'll get started in a couple of minutes or actually in a minute time. Uh, right. And I'm going to go ahead and start recording. Okay, it's actually recording. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Hyperledger in depth and hour with our member Simba Chain today. I'm very excited about today's session. Uh, we have three wonderful, actually four wonderful speakers uh, from the Simba Chain team. Um, and that includes Anjan Roy, who is the VP of Simba Chain, uh, Joel Nydig, who is our, the CEO, and Jeff Curtis, who is the VP of Defense and Supply Chain. And we also have Ian Taylor uh, from Simba Chain. So today they'll be talking about connecting supplier and Department of Defense blockchains for transparent part tracking. Uh, we welcome them and want to remind everyone uh, some uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, number one is that all Linux Foundation and Hyperledger meetings and events are covered under our antitrust policy. Policy. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, see the full policy on the Hyperledger or the Linux Foundation site. Uh, but just, you know, for, um, for a reminder, please don't share um, any competitive information um, that uh, you shouldn't be sharing. Uh, another reminder is that the session is being recorded, uh, and this will include the Q&A. So if you have any questions, just please uh, go ahead and share those with us, but we will be recording them. And after the session, we'll go ahead and make both the video and the slides available for all attendees and for additional viewers in the future. Another couple reminders. Uh, this is as interactive as you're going to get with the Simba team. Uh, normally, we would see each other in person at an event. You'll have you, they would give a talk and you would come over and have questions uh, and meet with them in the hallway. But we have an opportunity to interact with each other. Um, raise your hand um, if you have questions and we can promote you to speak. Um, if you have any questions, you can also pop them into the Q&A, which is just a regular Zoom Q&A, um, and in the chat. And if it would be great right now, we have a lot of participants, if you can go ahead and just say hello and where you are Zooming in from today, that would be great to see uh, kind of the coverage uh, around the world. So without further ado, I am going to send it over to the Simba team. If you can go ahead and share your screen and we can get started. Welcome everyone again. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And th thank you, um, Daniela, for, for inviting us in the Hyperledger community here. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Uh, I think I think we need to be in there. It says host disabled uh, screen sharing. Um, oh. I wonder if it's. I think she has to make you a host. I think I can be made a host or a panelist. There it goes. There we go. Okay, fabulous. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we're going to get things started. And, you know, uh, with this, uh, this project we wanted to talk about, and, and also a, a paper that was recently published, and we're lucky to have three of the, the three of the four or sorry, three of the authors and co authors of that paper here with us. I'm actually not one of them, but all three of my esteemed colleagues here are, are, are authors of this paper. Dr. Ian Taylor, our CTO, Joel Nidek, our CEO, Jeff Curtis, our, our guru for all things supply chain and logistics. Uh, and so, I mean, I'm going to pass things off, I think, to, to Joel. Would you like to intro this? And, and then, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, we'll, we'll go through the slide deck. And if, if uh, Dr. Taylor, please feel free to chime in, talk a little bit more in depth about, you know, parts of that, parts of the paper and what we've done. But it really showcases, you know, this particular project uh, relating to uh, supply chain and visibility and traceability in real time. So with that, uh, let's, let's do, uh, you know, the overall goal. But Joel, would you like to kind of start, start things off or? or one of our other colleagues here? Yeah, yeah, I think every, I'll have everybody introduce themselves. So my name is Joel Nidig. I'm the CEO of Simba Chain, co-founded with uh, Dr. Ian Taylor here. And uh, it's been very exciting. Uh, you know, Simba Chain started to uh, build out, you know, solutions for blockchain and make it really simplistic for different organizations. And we found a great place in government that is needing authenticity and auditability and traceability. And, and so this project came about from the U.S. Navy 
and currently funded by NAVAIR. And uh, it's been really exciting. It came out of a paper that uh, we've been working on with the University of Notre Dame, Boeing, and uh, Navy, and other partners like ITMCO. And uh, so we'll be going over how this, how this project came about, uh, what we've been doing in it so far, and also the paper that is very much more extensive than we can go over in a webinar uh, setting, but it's it's there. We'll show the link where you can go and uh, look at that paper uh, that's been published, and it's been peer reviewed. So it's pretty. It's a very great paper to uh, understand about how blockchain can be used in supply chain, and even in a government setting, as as there's a lot of complexity and moving parts and stakeholders that are involved that need to know and have that verifiability. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Taylor first, and then uh, if you want to pass it over to Jeff, and then you can bring it back to me. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Taylor. I'm CTO of uh, SimbaChain um, and uh, also a professor of computer science at the University of Notre Dame. So over to Jeff. Thanks, Ian. I'm Jeff Curtis. Um, I've been with SimbaChain about a year and a half. I'm the vice president of uh, defense and supply chain. I came to Simba after about 33 years at DOD, about 30 at the Defense Logistics Agency, and then the last uh, three and a half, four years with the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Um, Anjan Joel. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Yes. So, hi, and I'm Anjan Roy here, at Vice President of Simba Chain, and uh, one of the, I'm also the Vice Chair of the Public Sector SIG uh, Working Group here at the Hyperledger uh, Foundation. So. Again, uh, this is related to that because at least is semi-related to the public sector, um, a part of it. So this is um, certainly exciting and, and uh, thank you all for coming. So, you know, we'll get right into some, you know, the overall goal of this project, you know, Joel. Would yeah. You, you... So the, the overall goal, we wanted to track the parts that were coming from an OEM so that there's visibility into the DOD supply chain. We've all been through COVID. We understand the fragility of our supply chains. We have to, we have to now come together and realize that there's vulnerabilities in our supply chains. And so what's, what's really fantastic about this project is we actually started it before COVID. So we actually had been able to provide a lot of value uh, as COVID was happening to the Navy and it was really exciting. So, um, you know, for example, OEM like a Boeing I uh, would be able to, you know, be making a wing or a component uh, or tail hook or whatnot and providing that internal insight um, and sharing the progress, both in the purchasing of that item, the whole logistics, um, the, ma the maintenance, repair and operations of those different items, um, sh sharing that information using fabric blockchain. So this is, you know, this is obviously a Hyperledger fabric webinar. We are using Hyperledger fabric in this project. And it's been a great uh, open source tool to be able to uh, communicate the value of what blockchain or di distributed ledger technologies can provide to uh, government and stakeholders within their supply chain. So then uh, NAVAIR then uh, would receive these updates to gain more view into the, into the entire end process so that they can make decisions and have a better collaborative way of communicating with the, you know, OEMs and, and very significant partners that are in the supply chain. So the uh, parts we're tracking are tail hooks and wings from the F-18 uh, aircraft. So you can go to the next slide. So I'll go over this and then Ian, feel free to, or Jeff, you know, you guys can hop in to say anything that I might be missing, but the maintenance repair and overhaul um, is about the replacement and test measurements. I'm not sure, you know, everybody that's on this call. So, I'll, you know, if, if some of you may un completely understand this, you're, you have a manufacturing background, you have a supply chain background, but we're going to kind of dive into this a little bit. So the preventive maintenance are tasks that are scheduled regularly. So they, you know, it could be regarding in the, you know, updated design of a component that continues to fail. It could be in the equipment, you know, the functioning, how well is it functioning and, and providing that, uh, so that it's ready. You know, readiness is a big thing. Sustainment is a big thing within the military. And we have to be ready to whatever, you know, may come, come their way. So the corrective maintenance are tasks that are performed that failure occurs. So it's like fixing of an overhaul of the equipment, the machinery, the components that may be involved, that assemblies that go into that. So it's very complex assemblies. So we're, we're digging down into the bill of materials of these items and providing that uh, non-reputability, the predictive maintenance. So now we're, you know, wondering, okay, how do we now analyze, you know, if something's gonna, if the failure might 
might take place. How many flight hours does this have? You know, what what are those different uh, you know dials and and set points that we need to be aware of to make the warfighter successful in what they're doing. So the maintenance repair and operations, we really focus first on the tail hook and now we're moving into weeks. So uh, Ian or Jeff, anything to add to that? Now, I just uh, want I just to weigh in a little bit. I appreciate that. Thanks, Joel. Um, yeah. The corrective maintenance um, becomes more and more of a challenge, especially as a lot of these assets are older than we ever anticipated they would get. So that just becomes an increasing challenge of things breaking that you didn't anticipate would break. Uh, there may not be a supplier base and so on. So I'm sure we'll talk more about that um, as we move forward, but that's just kind of a, um, a challenge that just keeps getting more and more um, challenging. Mm -hmm. So uh, over there. Okay. So there are different levels of the MRO process and, and this is all detailed in the, in the white paper that we published, uh, like I said, in Elsevier uh, the blockchain journal. So, and I know there's a lot of discussion about blockchain, distributed ledger technology. For this, all intents and purposes, we're using these uh, for this for this session because we actually have connected with uh, block. We've done some uh, cross uh, communication between blockchains, so that's why we're using the blockchain and DLT interchangeably because we've done connectivity of both. So you'll see that later in the uh, the. the uh, diagrams of what we've been working on here. So there's an O-level maintenance that occurs in the organizational level of the, you know, in, of the Navy. And, uh, you know, it could be a single maintenance squadron. Um, it's responsible for the parts. And the intermediary I-level maintenance occurs when it is specialized. So now we're looking at kind of like um, the, uh, you know, there might be some kind of consuming diagnostics that are involved and some like back, you know, there might be a job shop that's kind of like, you know, back in the back corner that, you know, they're working, they're specifically good at like welding or something specific like that, or one's gr great at bearing analysis and like, oh, this bearing's about to fail. Uh, this pin in this tail hook is, you know, things like that. So the other level is the deep, the depot level. So this is where the maintenance occurs. Um, and this is a very highly specialized offsite repair. So they might even be into the fact that they actually have the diagnostic equipment that is specifically, and they may have a um, as opposed to just a welder, they may have a materials engineer. So they might have a metallurgist or something like specific that is like, they are like really almost down to like how the original design was intended and things like that. So that's, that's kind of where these, so just defining these different levels. So people understand like where this is taking place and you can start seeing like, wow, this is where smart contracts and you know having non-reputability and there's a lot of things that go wrong and if we can't immediately like pull up a system and say i know by on a shadow of doubt that this happened at this date and it's been time stamped basically notarized then you can kind of start seeing how communication can break down if we don't have this kind of real-time system capability to immediately validate and authentic authentic authenticate um and have that immutability so um and you can even imagine in large organizations when, uh, you know, Boeing or Navy, that nobody even knows, you, you probably are working on systems that you don't even know who the other person on the other end is. And this is obviously normal in, in a lot of different settings, but we have to have a, a, a moment of trust that like, you know, somebody's getting in a plane that's, you know, gonna fly. I need to know that this, the maintenance worker had signed off and that this is all checked and everything's great. So having those capabilities and then even knowing that the even down the line to the manufacturing and the sub-tier supply chains that things have been uh, done properly. That's that's very important. So Ian, next slide. So Ian, do you wanna talk any about the high level flow just briefly and then maybe a little about the paper? Yeah, I just posted the paper actually in the in the chat so everybody could, has a link to okay. it. But. Great. Yeah, I mean, from the previous side, um, uh, this gets pretty complicated, but essentially this is how the high level flow of what I have things work. Um, so um, we created um, a 28 page document <laughs> that describes this end to end flow. Um, but roughly what happens is, you know, using those things from the last slide um, at the O level. So at the, the carrier, aircraft carrier, they'll look at an F18, um, F they'll inspect the tail hook, for example, that'll be the O level. Um, if they can, you know, make a repair there, they will. If they don't, they'll take it to the eye level. 
Um, the eye level may have some, um, you know, equipment to be able to repair depending on what, what goes wrong. Um, if they can't repair it, then it goes to the D level, which is basically the um, repair shops uh, across the country, like FRC Southwest and Southeast and so forth. Um, so, so the, the part then will get transported um, using a carrier uh, from the uh, carrier, yeah, using a uh, transport carrier from the aircraft carrier to the um, the depot. The depot will um, uh, go through that process of overhauling that part or ordering a new one um, and then that will go back to the carrier and in, it'll be installed by the OI level. So so this is a complex process and it touches a lot of uh, data systems. So um, uh, we went through the entire process end to end and uh, analyzing all the data systems involved. There's about 30 different data systems uh, involved in this entire end to end process um, with 200 plus um, decision making points across that process. So it's quite a complex workflow. Um, there was around uh, 18 tables um, that we ingested to get the data that we needed for this, this uh, track and this flow. And that's about two and a half percent of the data. So by doing that analysis and going through this process, we essentially um, you know, found the data we needed rather than using the 97.5% that we didn't need. So next slide. So that, that's the kind of outline of the problem. Um, we thought we'd go through and give um, some slides about Semba Chain, how it kind of addresses these sorts of problems. So um, this is uh, sort of a, a, a flow of how um, Semba Chain is used. Um, and essentially on the, on the left here, this is a supply chain tracking scenario. So um, there's a parcel here, but imagine it could be anything, it could be a tail hook or whatever. Um, this is just illustrating that, that a particular uh, package could be tracked at different geographical locations and across different modes of transport, for example. Um, what, we, what we do in Simba is we, um, we look at those, uh, those entities, the assets and how they're tracked um, using a model. So we use assets to represent the, in this case, the, the assets that are tracked and then transitions that um, involve different stages of the journey, the, those transitions of state, if you like, of that or the update of that um, package as it's going through whatever system it's going through. So by specifying that those relationships, we actually um, write those relationships into the smart contracts. So the smart contracts are kind of annotated. So they have relationships um, explicitly between the different methods in the smart contracts. And what that enables us to do on the back end, um, the data that is recorded contains those relationships. So it contains essentially, you could think of them as, um, you know, a method and in Solidity, for example, have uh, a pointer to another method that it relates to. So, um, or in Fabric, um, it, it works a, a similar way. And then on the back end, we, we, um, we can query that data using tools. We have two implementations. One is GraphQL, and then we also have a, a graph database implementation. And the way kind of that works is we can, we can take in the graph database, we can uh, query it as a single system, but we can have off-chain data in the graph database, and we can also have on-chain data um, referenced within the database to the, the uh, underlying blockchain. And we can bring those together in one query. So from an application, they're querying a system, but some of that is tracked and some of it is not. Um, and in the DOD, we will put um, you know, flight critical components on that you know, as part of it, the, they'll be the ones tracked on the blockchain, the rest of the components that may be involved in the entire process, but, but not uh, flight critical, maybe off chain, for example. So next slide. Um, so Simba chain, the, um, aside from the, uh, the, the modeling we do um, and the input and the output, the, these are the various um, components in the system, just to give you an idea of the sort of, um, the, the, I guess, issues we address with, with Simba chain. Um, in the you know in the blockchain kind of life cycle, so I'll just go through this real quick. So um, at the center, there's different uh, there's blockchain. Uh, we support eight different blockchains. Hyperledger Fabric we support that natively now. So we map from these smart contract, well conceptual smart contract models directly to Fabric um, native. We we also uh, support the EVM the Burrow EVM um, implementation for Fabric as well, um, uh, and then. Um, the model that um, defines these assets and trans transitions also can be used to, to tie different versions of smart contracts together. And also that it can be used to connect different uh, smart contracts on different blockchains by essentially kind of marrying parameters across through um, 
from one uh, smart contract method to another smart contract method on a different chain. And that enables us to search both blockchains simultaneously. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and then sort of uh, on the front end of this, we have transaction validation and resilience. So as transactions come in, we validate the, the actual uh, content as opposed to kind of the method signature. So if you try and, you know, put a, a massive integer into a, a uint, you know, that something that's more than 32 bits, for example, it'll, it'll complain at that level rather than clogging up the blockchain. And then we also have a synchronous um, workers that uh, run for each, uh, each transaction where we need to. So in other words, if a lot of transactions come in and the blockchain can't keep up, we'll, we'll farm out these workers and, and they basically monitor the transactions until they get a receipt. Um, and then those are exposed through very simple APIs. So we, for, for each smart contract, we spin up a REST interface that is used to interact uh, with the smart contracts and blockchain. Um, so from a from an application standpoint, you just write into a REST API, a post will put data on chain and a, a query will uh, uh, search the, the data on chain scoped by that um, particular method or the smart contract. And on the back end, we have a transaction cache. This essentially, every transaction that is, is has a receipt that's recorded on chain, we cache in a database. And then we have an application that runs all of the time, checking the consistency of that uh, cache. And then when querying, you can use that cache or you can go directly to chain, depending on um, you know, which mode you want to use, but using the cache, it becomes super quick. And then we can search using GraphQL or graph databases, or, or we can search using direct queries to those endpoints and filtering. Um, those are all brought together in a dashboard and we have various SDKs to interact with all this stuff. And on, um, we also support transaction subscriptions, which I'll touch on later, and the ability to off-chain data. So you can add a file to a transaction when you put it on chain and that will um, you can retrieve that later and that's that file will be stored in a, a an off-chain file system um, and bound on chain using a hash code so next slide <clears throat> oh, and of course we have both around all of that which uh, for the in the dod use case we're using cat cards for uh, authorized uh, authentication to to the platform so yeah so next slide yeah, I think we can skip this one. Um, so just to kind of talk about the model, I, I touched on that earlier. Essentially, we have assets, which you can think of like a, of a, as a noun of a business process and transactions or transitions, we call them um, are verbs or relationships. So, so in this case, the assets would be a wing or a tail hug and the transitions would be, you know, the status from Boeing about, you know, what, what is the progress between zero and 100% of that wing? And they, they provide in that information in real time and they're, uh, they're querying their local systems to do that, and then they're, they're adding that um, to Hyperledger Fabric to, you know, to um, uh, transmit to Navair. Um, so this, this model can be deployed in any supported blockchain. As I mentioned, we have several now, and then an API is generated. So if you go to the next slide, we'll show how that kind of works. Um, the the map graph model as well, um, this will come in later, enables us to do these versions and, and connect to different blockchains. I'm going to show an example of that later. So next slide. Um, so uh, once you define your model and have the, def, you know, generate the smart contract or even just import a smart contract that's written elsewhere, you know, by through uh, using Remix or whatever, uh, we can import those too. Um, we go through this process. So the, the process of, um, uh, you know, trying deploying the smart contract is quite simple. It basically, you choose the blockchain network you want to deploy it on. Um, uh, in this case, it's Ethereum and a private um, Ethereum network called Circle of Life. If you click um, the button, Anjan. Yeah, oh, he's, he's got a stack up. Yeah, oh, I see. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, and then the next phase is, do you want off-chain data? And there's several sources there for uh, where you can store off-chain data if that is relevant to this particular application. Um, next. Then you choose a smart contract you want to deploy. In a Simba enterprise, uh, enterprise platform, um, you actually can select several smart contracts here. So per application is basically a container for multiple smart, smart contracts that each have uh, uh, REST APIs. So, so this is just choose, uh, choosing a container demo here. And then next slide. Um, then this um, uh, asks you to um, choose the, the name of the API um, that you'll hit and the name of the app. Um, and then next slide. And then once this is deployed on the blockchain, 
uh, we also generate these uh, interfaces um, uh, to, you know, there's a neat RE doc and Swagger interface to the re resulting REST API. So with the REST API, basically a method in, in a, say, if you're talking about solidity, a method will appear as a, an endpoint, a post will, a post with the parameters of that method will uh, transact on chain and, and a, uh, a get will do the query. Okay, so in the next slide. Um, this is smart contract designer just to give you a feel for what that looks like. So here is a additive manufacturing example. We have a AM component, um, the red a rectangle box there, the, those are the assets and the um, ellipses, the blue ellipses are the transitions. So you can kind of, uh, without writing any code, you can um, drag and drop these boxes in a web UI. So you can pick up a component, you can say, okay, the component needs to be manufactured. It's delivered, it's received somewhere and it's installed. In the case of MRO, that would be the kind of process. Uh, but a, a component um, in an additive manufacturing example, um, that actually points to a design, an STL file or a build file for, for that process, which can be updated. So just by, you know, creating this, these different relationships about how, you know, these different things interact, builds up a model of how, what the data looks like. And it gives a conceptual model about how that data should be queried after the fact. So click next. Um, each of these boxes, if you double click them, you can specify the parameters. So, so the boxes represent methods, for example, and the parameters represent, um, uh, you know, the payload of those. Um, next, um, click next. And then you click a button at the bottom and that auto generates the, the code, the smart contract code. This is, this is an example in Solidity, but it works a similar way for Fabric generating the chain code. And then next slide. Okay, so in the back to the never scenario, so what do we do here? Um, and this kind of bubbles up into a more um, high level architecture in a little bit, but essentially the way we're connecting um, the, the OEMs with the DOD is through um, two separate blockchains. Um, we have a quorum. In fact, we have three blockchains in, in the scenario in total. And I'll, and I'll give an example about the connectivity later, but essentially we have a, a consensus quorum a blockchain within the DOD that is basically bringing in the data from the MRO process we described earlier. And then we have a, that is connected to, the, you know, so the DOD have a simple chain platform that can access that network, for example. Uh, and then the OEM network is Hyperledger Fabric. So that, uh, we have that uh, fabric network set up now. Um, and that can, that is providing, you know, uh, Boeing is uh, transacting kind of data onto that fabric network to share with, um, you know, with Navair. So those two um, blockchains are, are connected through a single instance of Simba chain. So what um, what Nava are able to do there is query both blockchains simultaneously. And the way they're connected is essentially through a PO order. So a PO order ordering like a tail hook or, or a wing, for, for example, from Boeing is tied to a PO order parameter, you know, on the, um, uh, on the kind of OEM network. And we also use that PO number to uh, it, it, um, ingest or, or to connect to other uh, instances of blockchains that we already have, have created for other projects within the DoD that looks at public information. And I'll show that in a little bit. So if we go to the next slide. Um, we, we started off um, uh, when we initially connected uh, with Boeing, uh, we started off ingesting CSV files and writing those to Hyperledger Fabric. Um, this was, uh, partly due to, you know, there was a delay in gaining that connectivity uh, with Hyperledger Fabric, getting the right certs in and the permissions from the Boeing side. So this was essentially a temporary way to test the system. Um, so as, as what happened there was uh, Boeing queried their systems, they would generate a CSV file. Um, we provided a secure uh, service to, to um, receive that. And then we basically processed the uh, CSV file and, uh, uh, and write that into the Fabric Network. Now, um, about a month ago, we, we've uh, connected uh, right to the um, Boeing instance. So now we can do this without using these CSV files anymore, but this was kind of the journey we went through in this, in this project. So next uh, slide. And that, this is the overall kind of architecture for how this works. <laughs> so um, essentially um, on the left side here, um, uh, we have the, the data from the OEMs. So the, the way that works is they have a, 
um, a data collector component that queries their ERP systems uh, for the information, which basically is extracting the status of a particular, um, you know, a particular path. For example, a wing can take months to make for um, under progress, but there's progress within that time frame. So, from Navair's perspective, they they place an order and they wait until that order is filled, and and they can use you know historical data to understand roughly when that happens. But then, when other orders come in within Boeing, for example. Um, which are super urgent that might delay schedules and so this this information changes so they're querying their um, underlying system and they're looking to see you know they're looking at the bomb which is the bill of materials they're looking at the the wing and they're, they're assessing the progress of that particular part and they're collecting that information and then they're using our sdk then to connect two fabrics so so our SDK, we have SDKs in uh, Python and Java and in, in, in Node and, and in .NET. They're using the Python um, SDK um, and that just uh, interfaces the data collector to using some code that basically just makes it even easier to connect to the REST API. And then they pass that data to the REST API using an authentication layer. And then that hits the REST API and it goes through um, the various things I, I talked about earlier. So if there's, you know, that goes in, it, goes in a synchronous transfer, transacts on the chain, they wait for the receipt and that kind of gets cached. So all of that process goes on all of the time. And then from the other systems, they have a similar flow. They have already a, a basically a, a multiple, multiple levels of flows that collect all of this data from various places. Um, and then at the bottom, these are the, the structure of the um, different um, you know, networks and the OEM, the part info is coming from now there and then the the, the part supplier info and updates is coming from the OEMs. So next slide. And um, this is um, the two smart contracts we we uh, we were looking at um, using. So this is from the Nava side, <clears throat> looking at different work orders and connecting data through the MRO process, which then bubbles up into the POs that go out of the system. If we go to the next slide, that shows kind of a how we connected this. So. This is maybe a little bit hard to see, um, uh, but essentially what this is showing here, um, I tried to draw a line uh, between these two networks. So on the right hand side here, you've got the Hyperledger fabric. So this, this is running basically on the OEM network and that's um, providing updates from the OEMs to Navair about the progress of, of the, the particular parts. And then what we, we did, which I, I mentioned the third blockchain earlier, and we, we'd written a, uh, a parser or ingester maybe for Publog, which is um, public information about every transaction a, a OEM has with the DOD. There's a public database, it turns out, with all of these transactions in. Um, so we, we wrote a, a parser for those, uh, for another project and ingested information from public, Publog, about the status of these various parts. And we, we re-ran that process to extract information um, about uh, the parts that were involved in, in this process of so the wings and the tail effects and so forth. So we preloaded this blockchain um, uh, with this information and we connected these two together. So we connected the, through using the PO, we connected these two together. And what that enabled us to give um, is to, uh, we were able to take those parts and automatically lock up all the suppliers for those parts or take that part and lock up a particular supplier for that part and even get the zip code and look where, where that supplier was. So all of this public information really enhanced kind of the, the graph of information that um, is, is flowing through the system. So next slide. And then at the back end, we have these search and access APIs. I'll just, if you go to the next slide, I'll just show how the GraphQL works. Um, so this is our GraphQL interface. So <clears throat> based on the um, relationships we defined earlier, and um, this is basically showing uh, some of the, the, the you know, the interactions. Um, this is more aligned with PubLog, but, but the general idea here is, um, you know, we have a supplier part here, which has, which has a relationship with a part, which has a relationship with a part extra detail. It also has a relationship with a supplier, and it also has a, a relationship with um, whether there's a non-conformant record of this particular part. And if you, um, the system we've, we've created for, for querying basically enables the user just to walk through that process. So you just kind of like click on the data, click on the, 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 you know, the data set you want to extract in the query. 
So here, I click supply part on the left here, and the green, uh, the green color there is saying basically those are the things that are selectable from he here. So, so it's giving you a hint about where you can go in the graph in order to select data. So those are selectable. Now, if you click on a part, for example, then that makes the part detail also selectable because that has a direct relationship, but it wasn't selectable from the supplier part directly. So you can use this process to go walk through the graph, select the journey you want for in terms of the query you want. And on the right hand side here, you can select the parameters from those, those transactions that you want to extract. And then you can also add filters. So you can do things like, you know, okay, ex query this part of the graph, um, but just give me information when a NEN equals certain uh, a certain thing, or give me information if a, you know, if the part name contains, uh, you know, tail hook, for example. So you can do queries like that and that extracts the data. And then when you quit, you, you hit the query on that, you'll get data back. So if you go to the next slide, the data then is click throughable because it's a, it's a structured um, embedding, right? It's a, it's, it's a graph QL structure. It's not a true graph uh, per se, but um, in this example, but you know, the first level gives you that first box on the previous slide. So that'll give you all the supplier parts. And then at the bottom of those, you'll have related information that you can click through. So in this case, you, you click through to the part in, this, in the second level, and then the, that's the part information there. And then you click again for the part detail, and that goes through the next level of the data structure in order to, so you can see um, the detail at each level. So this is the kind of querying that the, you know, that is uh, capable in that graph. And you can do this across, like I said, across those two or three blockchains that we're connecting together and retrieve information, connect data across those so you can enhance the experience. Um, and then next slide. Hey, Ian, if I could, before you move yeah, into sure. this very simple chart. Um, the, um, one of the things that, uh, from what Ian was talking about, about visualizing, um, when we talk about supply chain risk management, um, a lot of times we end up in a position still across DOD and across, I think even commercial suppliers of pay and chase. You buy something, it shows up, and then you find out that it's not what you wanted. It's non-conforming. You know, the lawyers always say, be careful about the word counterfeit, but it's not what you thought you were getting. And now you got it. And not only do you have to get your money back, you have to see if it's gone out anywhere, has it gone forward and so on. But you can actually visualize um, this tool or use it to visualize. So you can say, I'm getting ready to make a buy from cage code X. Um, what have we bought from them in the past? Has any been, have any been non-conforming? Uh, where do they come from? Um, as this grows, you know, hopefully you have um, multiple um, upstream suppliers, you know, uh, up to, you know, supplier uh, number one, then all the way to N and see, you know, this one we've never had a problem with, or we have had problems with. And I can assure you every time you use your credit card, they're doing that. When you swipe that card, it's gonna say, it's gonna take a look and say, hey, does the Curtis family usually shop in West Virginia? Um, do they usually buy this type of thing? What's the dollar value? And I use West Virginia because my daughter's mom used to take her back to Ohio State a lot from here in Northern Virginia. And that credit card would bounce a lot in West Virginia. It just didn't match with the rest of our lives and how we used mm -hmm. it. So they're trying to keep track of that and keep bad things from happening up front by blocking it up front. This gives you the tools to start to head in that direction. And it's just a great thing that, um, you know, I did many years at DLA and I don't know where they are with this now, but we were heading towards the part of, you know, looking at item supplier and price. Is the price way out of line? Is this an item that has a history of challenges? Is the supplier uh, somebody that could be cage hopping or is uh, sharing an address with nine other companies doing lots of other different things in some Wyoming suburb, uh, which by the way, has happened. So this is a way to get in front of things and to visualize something that otherwise you'd just be looking at very bland data. And there's a good chance you would miss something that was there, but this allows you to take that and really turn it into something that uh, would right. be much more useful, kind of turning data into information, which is something right. before I, I see Anjan and Joel getting ready to talk, they've heard me say so many times that so many of us are data rich and information poor. Can we turn it into information? And that leads us in that direction. And I will pause there and take a breath. Yeah, and I think exactly, Jeff, it's just, actionable data 
you can set notifications to yeah. what you what you care about. And as we as more and more OEMs and governments and groups start using systems like Hyperledger and you know various connectivity tools, you will have now a, a basically an Oracle service that you can know and there people can come to complete agreement and consensus on items. Because right now it's there's it's it's continually adjudication, just like Jeff spent probably his majority of his career adjudicating you know more majority of items you know that just were problem childs and th different things like that so anyway what ian going yeah or jeff you want to say something no i was just saying you mentioned uh the adjudication um by the time i ended my career and i was in a pretty senior position by the my lives were just kind of hell or my days were kind of hellish because by the time anything came to me nobody had solved it and they had tried so i only got <laughs> <laughs> things yeah. and you as ceo of the company i'm sure are going to are going through the same thing by the time they get to you or to me or to whomever um other folks have tried they failed and there's nothing easy about what's left yeah. they're going to have to make decisions and fight the battles on this so yeah but if this allows folks to identify things a lot earlier um that, that's just a wonderful thing mm -hmm. yeah. we'll try next slide here Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> well, if you go to the previous slide, um, this is just the, an example of a graph using the same data. So this is our graph. We're actually using Neo4j uh, from a technical standpoint, but this enables us to um, uh, essentially create a graph of the data, which can, in the case of supply chain, um, you know, a graph enables you to represent a supplier, then I have a supplier point to another supplier have a, you know, a relationship with another supplier and so forth to do multiple levels of supply chain. So uh, whereas GraphQL is very hard to do that. Um, and this this enables us to put this data in this format and connect on and off chain data kind of seamlessly to, to one query essentially. This isn't a, something we present to customers, but um, we can run a query from a UI to get a very complex set of data across you know this graph and populate it in a simplified user interface and we're, you know, we're using um, kind of simple user interfaces essentially up that, up that side of things. And then uh, the next slide, <clears throat> just as kind of really the last thing to touch on is, is the subscription. So um, one of the um, one of the parts of the uh, tool, the Silver Chain Enterprise platform that I touched on earlier was the ability to do subscriptions. These can also support logic, so you can, you know, you can filter, add filters that can be chained together. So you can do things like, you know, notify me if the identity, you know, the ID of a component is eight seven five six in this example, and the name is Ian for or, or whatever. You can do that and, and add, you know, quite complex kind of logic statements that, um, uh, that where where the conditions have to be met in order for the notification to trigger. Um, but you can add these on a on a basically a blockchain method level, um, and then filter on the on the um, parameters of that method, and then you can connect this to um, through SMS or, or uh, send emails or web notification targets, so you can connect it to other systems to trigger other processes. And next slide, um, which I think is the final slide, and this is the interface to that. So. You know, it's a very similar idea. Um, you choose basically what you want to um, what you want to filter on. Uh, you choose the conditions about how that happens, and then you click subscribe, and then that you just get notifications as data that meet, meets that um, those conditions uh, come into the network. That's it. Great. Great. So, any questions or thoughts, comments? Uh, not surprisingly, I, I had another comment. Um, you know, every time when Ian was walking through this, there were so many pieces of information flowing in so many directions and so many literal physical parts um, moving around. Every one of those tends to be a chance for a hiccup and for things to become unmatched. Um, but with blockchain, Hyperledger, you're talking immutability, um, things are going to match. Um, and you know, back to one of my catchphrases that I learned at DLA was single version of the truth. Um, I'm presuming we have some folks on here from DOD, you know, we all live the dream and continue to do so of uh, reaching financial auditability. 
And that doesn't mean we were wasting money or that we were losing stuff. It just means that the books didn't necessarily balance the way they should according to generally accepted accounting principles. This can help uh, go a long way towards making sure things line up. There is one version of the truth, which is the right number of versions of the truth. And sometimes, you know, you can look at medical records within DOD. You can look at book to floor and floor to book in um, depot systems. You're going to have mismatches, and this will help reduce that a lot significantly. So I'll, I'll pause there. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And you know, we're, I know we've, we've had some good engagement in the chat box. Uh, great to see everyone from all over the world. I see California, Munich, Germany represented. Um, but, but we do have a question um, from Nicholas, and and uh, th thank you and uh, for the um, the feedback there. Um, this is uh, we're glad that you think this is a great presentation. Yeah. A question Nick, but Nicholas does ask is, you know, what are the tangible benefits, you know, in terms of dollar savings or to, to Department of Defense, Boeing, other vendors? Um, you know, it may not always be about dollars, like like you said, Jeff. You know, you know, it's but it may be about risk. It may be about yeah. availability. It may, you know, which is a type of risk. It may be about um, auditability, you know, which, you know, the DOD, you know, struggles with, but, mm -hmm. but, but tries to get a little better. Uh, and that's obviously a can of worms. Uh, so your question on that, you know, as far as the, and you did touch on it, but tangible benefits. And, yeah. And then also how easy is it for a new vendor to be onboarded into a network like this? So yeah, I can, Joe, I can take, Joe, you want to take I that? can take that. So well, we did, we did analysis. So about like 15% of items are scrapped and that is a combination of, and I've got a, there's a, uh, I have an article coming out here soon about this um, in one of the manufacturing magazines. Um, but about 15% of items uh, total scrap. And what we've been able to determine is we can in, uh, improve that, if not um, eliminate a lot of the majority of it, because some of it is actually due to non traceability. They actually throw things away because they can't actually show provenance of where it came from. They literally just throw it away. And so, you know, you have a heat treat code that just didn't get put on previous at the heat treat. Well, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things we can do to, to tie purchase orders, geolocation and identification and uh, to, to, to find out when that heat code, that heat lot came from. So that's just an example of like a heat treated component material uh, example and, and providing a immutable and non-reputable like Hyperledger Fabric can provide in connectivity with your supply chain, you can then immediately be able to verify and validate and query and find out where this, where these items came from. So that's the value nice. that we can bring. And I think about 40% of there's the, just to give an example, the, the tail hooks about, uh, you know, $40,000 plus potentially with combining of the, of the components and uh, about $40,000 worth of that item, 40% of it's like paperwork. So as we get to more of a digital world and provide a more digital footprint uh, capability, query ability, instant real-time notifications, you can really start saving, you know, a lot of dollars mm -hmm. on those different things. So um, about at the end of this project, I'm sure we'll have a very detailed thing, but I was just trying to give this some anecdotal. And then onboarding that government customer, obviously this takes large partnerships, a lot of time. This is not a fast moving uh, capability, but once we get things rolling and you get these networks built out like hybrid or fabric and these different uh, networks, you can then immediately uh, start realizing benefits about the data being shared. So, yeah. um, but that's, that's, that comes through a lot of like contracting, um, yeah. you know, working together, there's OTAs, there's SBIRs, there's, you know, a lot of um, innovation capabilities that, you know, uh, uh, you know, vendors can go after to, to get these projects rolling. Yeah. So. If, if I was to comment, like what you just said, Joel, a lot of that time to onboard new vendors is largely contractual or otherwise human. It's offline yeah. stuff. It's not, if, yeah. if, 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 if the question was more about the technology, the onboarding of new vendors or new network participants is a, uh, it's a very different conversation. If, if all the, if all the contracts and the bureaucracy and the human decisions are, um, are, are, are abstracted away, mm -hmm. which of course is not reality. But if they were, the actual, you know, the the the, the, the actual technical plumbing is pretty fast, right? You know, yeah. The, the DOD is yeah. fast moving towards a zero trust infrastructure, so that we can not 
you know, these centralized certs and different things like that are causing very much problems, especially. Um, so to get to more of a zero trust capability, open source, where it's very transparent, Hyperledger Fabric, Linux Foundation, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or, and all the other, diff you know, Hyperledger Sawtooth, we support that too. And Hyperledger Burrow, as Ian also described. So um, just different capabilities and, and kind of bringing partners together. But yes, definitely the onboarding uh, can be fast. We are work. we have a continuous authority to operate that'll be going into platform one, which is Air Force's platform. So there's there's different things, especially if you're going into RDT network, that's thought more complex. So there's a little bit long time for the risk management framework and ATOs that have to get processed. So to try and move towards more a cloud infrastructure is obviously a lot faster onboarding. Mm -hmm. So I think we have another question. Okay. Do we have, uh, it was a, a question. Do we have another question? Um, Maybe this, this is a question. If you'd like to ask questions, either raise your hand <laughs> and uh, that was Daniel me, yeah. will promote you. Yeah. So just a reminder to everyone, if you want to ask questions, please go ahead. You can put it in the chat, you can put it in the Q&A, or just raise your hand and uh, I'll go ahead and promote you to uh, permit talking. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it'd be yeah. great and have an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, I do have a question, and this is something that we've been getting very often, uh, specific to consensus quorum. Um, so there's two flavors uh, of quorum that consensus provides. One is quorum pro uh, go, and one is uh, Hyperledger Bezu based. Uh, which version does Simba support? So we're supporting the go version, I believe, Ian, is that correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah, and then the Bisu is Java based, I believe, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah, so they, and consensus, obviously we were very close to consensus. Uh, so we use, we're a great partner of ours because we use their technology and they are, no, they're, they're moving. I know they're moving. The idea is to continue to merge those kind of more and more together mm -hmm. to kind of build this mm -hmm. capability where BSU and uh, the Go consensus quorum can continue to come together. So, mm -hmm. but I think there's all, obviously that's on their roadmap from what, from what we've heard. So, but, but great value to the Hyperledger community for that, to have that kind of integration. Great, thank you. Yeah. There's a, another question in the chat. Is the DOD mandating that its vendors use this blockchain network? So the DOD um, is continuing to research. Obviously, they're not the fastest uh, adop adopters of the technology, but they continue to provide, you know, build out specific solutions is what they're looking for. And I think eventually there'll be um, mandates for different blockchain networks. Like I'm, I'm, what we envision is that Department of Defense within Navy, Air Force, uh, Marines, just like there, a lot of them have multiple different cloud, multi-cloud, there's going to be multi-blockchain. So multi-cloud, you know, there's not, just like we've seen with Jedi, there's not going to be like, okay, one group's going to have, even in an open source world, is going to have one capability. So there's going to be multi-cloud capabilities. We have to have lots of collaboration. Um, and we know that uh, we think the Department of Commerce will have something, Department of Energy will have something, Treasury, mm -hmm. we're seeing this with central bank digital currencies. Mm -hmm. So all these different things, and I think there will be mandates coming out. And, um, you know, Simba Chain is agnostic. We are an agnostic uh, platform. We just connect to different, we're an API layer. So we just utilize, we're not at the protocol level. We what you know, Hyperledger Fabric figure out the, the protocol items and we just connect and help you know, uh, build applications. So that's our, that's our mission to make it yeah. easy. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's safe to say that, you know, yeah, they're not going to, there's not going to mandate on one particular vendor or standard. There's all sorts of reasons to many good reasons to not do that. Um, you know, and, and Jeff can probably speak to this, but what we can probably assume is that, you know, certainly interoperability and that's, and that yeah. could mean a hundred different things. There's so many gradations of interoperability, but to the extent that there is some type of uh, you know, because then it, it goes to the, the, the spirit of kind of open solutions versus kind of wall gardens and closed solutions. So to the extent that there can be interoperability to, to, to some greater degree, uh, one would think that that would be seen more favorably by this particular institution, you know, right. or any government institution. I, I do have to say there will be like STIG requirements, you know, these uh, yeah. security requirements that have to be stood up, uh, containerized requirements. And a lot of that is the continuous authority to operate, authority to operate, risk management framework, all that has to be done. We are, 
we are working very hard to be able to publish what we've done. We don't have all that information allowed to be shared, but we hope to publish that to the community. So everybody can now go, yeah. oh, this is how I do a STIG Hyperledger Fabric implementation or, you mm -hmm. know, whatnot. So that's, that's our goal is like, to get, keep, continue to give back to the community. We've done some updates on uh, showing users how to do Hyperledger uh, EVM 2.1 uh, installations and helping like writing scripts and making that a lot more manageable and different things like that. So we, we continue to provide that open source, you know, we, as much as we can yeah. as a, as a private company yeah. to, to commit back to the community. Yeah. But this paper itself, please do take a look at it. The team put a tremendous amount of work yeah. into this and uh, months and probably with, six months of work to, with, like, get with a lot of people. And, yeah. yeah. And some of the hardest was the approval. And Ian can speak to that. Uh, it, well, if he if he wants to, it's yeah. he he had to do a lot of that approving and, and re-editing. Uh, so we're we're certainly on the gas pedal trying to get as much of this out as possible. So please do check out that paper because that was that went through a lot of approvals to get it, mm -hmm. uh, to, and and we're trying to you know shed a light and make as much of this public as we can and for, say, for yeah, the community. And, yeah, so. and say what we can because it we can't do it all. We need the whole entire community to implement the blockchain technology throughout the governments because we believe that transparency and equality will bring about, you know, great innovation. Yeah. And that's our, that's, you know, one of our main mission is to, you know, just make this a very uh, mass adoption kind of yeah. play. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Daniel, Alfonso has a question. So. Yeah. Alfonso, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, Alfonso. Hello, Alfonso. Alfonso, if you want to unmute, you can ask your question. Hmm? Maybe not. Maybe I'm uh, Yeah. Uh, well, I don't have, I don't one. have one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So he just raised his hand. Um, excellent. Well, if anybody else has questions, we're at the top of the hour, close to the top of the hour. If anybody has uh, questions for the Simba Chain team, can you let them know how uh, they would go about getting in touch with you? Um, yeah. Sure, uh, you can contact us. Um, you know, certainly, you can uh, reach out to the Hyperledger community. They can put, you know, Danielle can put you in touch with us. Um, my my email is, and I'll put it on here. It's anjanroy at gmail uh, Sorry, at simbachain.com. You can get me at Gmail as well, but uh, <laughs> simbachain.com. And uh, I'm I'm one of the Hyperledger liaisons here at, at Simbachain. So. You're welcome to reach out to me and I can put you in touch with the right person at SimbaChain uh, that, 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 uh, that you can be speaking with. Uh, and, and certainly Daniela has, and the rest of the community here uh, has, has my contact information and we talk all the time. So mm -hmm. it's, it's always yeah. great to speak with it's, this community. It's, it's like a great community here yeah. at Hyperledger, there's no doubt about it. And our website has plenty of information so you can get contact yeah. with us. We have an intercom uh, yes. chat function too so you can communicate right with yeah. our, one of our customer service representatives yeah and you can go to info at simba chain contact you know at some chain or contact us so you know absolutely so i want to thank the simba chain team today for this presentation for sharing the work and very importantly and um uh, Joel just mentioned this, the contributions that Simba Chain has done back into the community, right? It's not just about using the code, it's about sharing the opportunity, uh, you know, code and bugs and stuff like that. So we really appreciate your, your, your contributions to our open source community as well. Um, so I want to thank everyone for attending today. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to the Simba Chain team with questions or myself, and we're happy to uh, connect you. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, Hyperledger in-depth an hour with our members. Uh, series. Um, we aim to have two of these a month. Uh, next month, we have Cripsy uh, is going to be doing a, a, an hour around best practices and major obstacles for upgrading to Hyperledger Fabric 2.2. Um, and then the following uh, webinar will be on August 18th with Provinci talking about verifiable credentials and how to bring students and employees back to school uh, in respecting their privacy in the COVID area, era, which is obviously something that is top of mind for everyone uh, nowadays. Uh, so once again, um, make sure that you check out the Global Forum. We do have some great content from our July Global uh, Public Conference uh, with um, lots of supply chain use cases as well as others uh, to take a look at, public sector, et cetera. So please do uh, look at those sessions that are available online. 
Um, and as always, please get involved. There's lots of ways to get involved within our hyperledger community, the special interest groups, um, the working groups, the technical projects themselves, um, the meetup communities is strong and we are starting to see some meetup communities getting together in person. So hopefully we'll be seeing you all in person uh, as well at events and meetups around the globe. Uh, so once again, thank you for watching. Um, this will be posted on uh, YouTube uh, as well as on our website and we'll provide uh, additional details for everyone via email. So thanks again and have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks a lot, bye-bye.